From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch is featured on this week's cattle market segment, among other things. She'll size up the numbers from last Friday's USDA Cattle on Feed report. Then from the U.S. Agency for International Development, Vern Long, We'll talk about that agency's announcement last week that it will be renewing its support for three of the Feed the Future Innovation Laboratories at K-State, awarding over $21 million in support of those initiatives. And on this week's 4-H segment, Jeff Wickman talks with K-State's Beth Hinshaw and Sarah Keatley about applying for the Youth Leadership Council and National Conference. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Agriculture Today. And to get things going on this Monday edition, a look at the cattle market trends and a USDA cattle on feed report, which carried a measure of surprise in it last Friday. We'll get to that in just a second. Joining us this time around is the senior economist with the Livestock Marketing Information Center based in Denver. To remind you, that is a project co-sponsored by K-State and several other land-grant universities. Talking once more with Caitlin McCulloch. Caitlin, just a quick summary of the cattle trade this past week. The cash market, well, another week of lower money at the feedlots, it appears. Well, on the Fed side, we saw prices come down a little bit um, over the course of the week. Uh, Steers over 80% choice end of the week at 108.15 per hundredweight in the five area markets, and the weekly accumulated was 109.08, which is down a little bit from last week, uh, which ended the week at 109.91 per hundredweight. Let's get right to the cattle on feed numbers from Friday afternoon. The uh, thought going in was that the placements number would be higher, and uh, most in the trade anticipated that, but not as high as the USDA came up with in its number. That's right. Placements were 7.9% above a year ago compared to what the consensus of the pre-report estimates were about 5.5%. Above a year ago, we did have a few folks kind of up that high, but in general, this was definitely on the high side of the ranges. To what do you attribute that as you analyze the number then? Well, when we look at regionally where those placements um, became, they were rather large percentage gains outside the southern plains. Out of the 10 states that are kind of tracked with that report, only three reported increases less than 8% above a year ago. So it was fairly widespread. Texas, though, was one of those states that was not up over 8%. So it seems like we're seeing quite a bit of early weaning taking place here early in the summer. The weight breakdown points to animals less than 700 pounds being those categories showing the largest increases on a percentage basis. We take that to mean that weaning out in the countryside is taking place at a faster rate than it was last year, placing some of those later weight animals a little bit earlier than maybe they did the year before. As you would consider it, does any of that have to do with our poor pasture conditions in certain states like Kansas, like Oklahoma, even eastern Colorado, where the drought took its toll? I think that did play a factor. Colorado was one of those states that had placements across all four weight group categories up over 20 percent in each. So, you know, probably not necessarily just from um, early weaning and that sort of thing. Kansas also had more diversity in the weights placed, um, whereas typically when we're thinking of drought concentrated in the southern plains, maybe a little bit in Colorado, you don't necessarily see that in Texas as much. Now, the marketing's number was right in line with expectations, so nothing unexpected there, correct? Right, so marketing's was slightly ahead of where the industry came in, um, coming in at 5% um, above a year ago whereas the industry was at 4.9, so not not a whole lot of surprises there. 
What is the takeaway from the report then, do you think, as we look to the the longer term into the fall and winter with these higher than expected placements? Is that a, a caution signal to the market, so to say? I don't think it was a secret that we have more cattle out there. You know, that's been a trend that's been for a long time. These marketing and placement levels um, were the highest July figure since 2012. But what's really, I think, the industry is going to be looking at is that August 1 cattle on feed inventory is the highest on record since the series dates back to 1996. What that does mean with lighter weight placements is you're probably going to have a lot more cattle continue to be on feed for longer. We've talked about in the past this 120-day or more feeding situation. That's really been above a year ago for quite some time. And with continued lighter weight placements, that's going to continue. So there is some concern, you know, how high weights get on the other side when those animals come out because they've been on feed for so long. But it seems like we're still, beef demand still remains pretty good. When we look at the cold storage report, yes, beef in cold storage did jump over both last month and a year ago. We added about 36 million pounds in cold storage, but a lot of it was in the boneless beef category. And the cold storage report doesn't necessarily break that out into what what beef cuts are going into cold storage, but that boneless number makes me wonder if most of that is actually coming from the higher beef cow slaughter rates that we've seen um, this year, and so that some of that might be just more ground beef as opposed to those higher value muscle cuts. Now, we don't know for sure because, again, it doesn't break it out. But if that is the case, that means we're still using, you know, the cuts we see from these steers and heifers at a fairly good rate, although obviously that can change moving forward. Presumably that cold storage report out from the USDA did indicate overall, though, that we've uh, substantial volumes of red meats and poultry as well. Right. So competing proteins definitely remain in the background of this demand profile for beef and where the consumer at the retail level is going to make selections. Mm -hmm. Beef wasn't the only one to see increases. We did see increases in lamb and I believe in poultry. Pork actually, though, did fall to about 548 million pounds, and that's actually 1% below last year and 2% below the previous month. So pork is kind of that competing meat that I think earlier in the year we were looking at and saying, wow, this could really take away something from beef. But pork prices have dipped low enough that it seems like people aren't interested in storing pork at this time, whereas on beef we haven't seen prices necessarily make that adjustment and kind of go through marketing channels at quite the same rate as we've seen pork. You mentioned just a second ago, Caitlin, Nicole, Cal, Slaughter, and in fact, you've numbers for the month of July on cull cow sales, and the story in brief suggests that those sales have been pretty substantial. So the sales of cull cows has been, the volume itself has been up, and we've seen prices dip in relation to that. Total cow slaughter is up 5% year to date above last year and has been fairly consistently above a year ago. Now, when we look at kind of the more details in what negotiated cull cow prices have done and what those individual carcass grade qualities have done, um, we are seeing some high volumes of boner and cutter cows and actually premium white to some extent, depending on the region. And that's really put pressure, I think, on what the cull cow prices have done, especially in the last month or so. And that pressure is likely to remain for a time, it would seem, as we get into the fall and winter then? I believe so. I think people are looking at where prices are and some of these big reports and making some decisions about what they're going to do on farm. And so we're seeing decisions made about whether to retain heifers, you know, how fast those turnover rates are going to be on the beef cow side. And I would expect higher levels of beef cow slaughter to kind of continue at least through the fourth quarter. All right. And Caitlin, want to briefly reference another article that you have on the LMIC.info website, and that's talking about the latest USDA crop production report, which did include an update on hay production. We've been considering this for the last several months in this area and elsewhere in the Central Plains. Again, the drought and the uh, negative impact on hay productivity and therefore prices. What did that USD report say about hay prices for cattle going forward? Well, it's it's kind of interesting in terms of hay because we did see increases in alfalfa acres this year on the acreage report, but they were in some areas that we don't necessarily think of as high producing alfalfa alfalfa states, but nevertheless that did show a bump in acres 
and consequently a little bit of a higher yield than we were expecting is now expected for alfalfa. So we are expecting a little bit higher production on the alfalfa side. Other hay, though, the yield drop for other hay is expected to be significant. Those are in states that we see a lot of other hay production where we have a lot of dryness, a lot of drought, and that yield drop is expected right now to be 11% below 2017 and the, probably the lowest number since the drought of 2012. That puts total production about 7% below a year ago when everything's said and done. Now, we have seen some late season precipitation in the southern plains. Does that mean we can get some cool grasses going and possibly some other forage? Absolutely, but I think expectation-wise, you're looking at tighter hay supplies into next year. There's been several states that have seen their hay prices move up, even though, you know, this is typically the time of year where you start to see hay prices come down, you know, through the summer as more yield, more production gets taken off those fields. We haven't really seen that to be the case. There's several states that are now over $200 a ton for all hay, and those states are going to really struggle to see any kind of price break much before the next marketing year. We'll monitor that, of course. So the market will be digesting the USDA cattle on feed report from last Friday as it goes into this trading week. Can we expect the market to take another step back as we look at the the cash fed market and the futures, Caitlin? That's a good question. Having higher placements in July, we do have a higher volume of calf crop coming in. Mm -hmm. And whether that means Placements just further on down will be a little bit lighter than maybe we would have anticipated early on. I think some of this is going to come down to timing. Where do we, where do we get the bulk of those cattle coming out? What's the market doing? What are our exports doing? So I think a little bit it's a wait and see. But in the near term, I would expect the market probably is going to react fairly, somewhat negatively to these two reports. We appreciate your comments, and we'll catch up with you again soon, Caitlin. Many thanks to you. Thank you. She's Caitlin McCulloch on the staff of the Livestock Marketing Information Center. She is the senior economist there, and she's been kind enough to share her observations on the cattle market trends on agriculture today. We'll be back in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. For several years running now, the U.S. Agency for International Development has partnered with Kansas State University in support of special laboratory initiatives under the Feed the Future banner. This is something that USAID has sponsored for quite some while. And we'll remind you of the objectives of this initiative and tell you of a new announcement to uh, reinforce that support for these laboratories. A contingent from U.S. Agency for International Development was in Manhattan recently to share the news. And the Acting Director for the Office of Agriculture Research and Policy, USAID Bureau for Food Security, Vern Long among them. And she's allowed us a few moments to tell us what's happening with the Feed the Future Innovation Laboratories. Vern, welcome to Kansas State, first of all. Thank you, Eric. I'm really pleased to be here and to share some of our stories with your audience. And there's value in reminding folks who aren't acquainted with the U.S. Agency for International Development just what it is. Share some background, if you would. Yes, the U.S. Agency for International Development is the premier development agency of the U.S. government. We work closely across the U.S. government federal agencies, Department of Agriculture, Department of State, to advance our goals on uh, governance, food security, global health, and a number of other pressing issues across the developing world. The Bureau for Food Security is the bureau within the Agency for International Development that is uh, mandated with implementing and leading the Feed the Future initiative, which is an initiative of USAID and 10 other federal agencies that work together to really contribute to the fight against global hunger. Uh, 
on the origins of the Feed the Future initiative, how far back does this go, actually? Several years? Uh, yes. USAID and uh, the U.S. government generally have been very active in agricultural development for decades. But uh, basically in 2007, 2008, there were food price spikes. Many of the your listeners are probably very familiar with the commodity prices at that time. And the consequence was basically populations that have very little money, poor people across the developing world, couldn't afford to pay those prices. And there was a lot of insecurity and unrest that resulted from those. This initiative was uh, a presidential initiative geared towards tackling those challenges head on. And uh, in 2008, 2009, this was launched as an initiative. It grew to be very successful. It has a very robust accountability system, monitoring and evaluation to really assure the U.S. taxpayer that each dollar we spend on this work really contributes to our goals of ending poverty and global hunger. In 2016, the Global Food Security Act was passed, and this was an act that brought strong bipartisan support across the aisle to really institutionalize this initiative. Feed the Future continues now under that broad bipartisan support from Congress and has been uh, continuing to do this work across a number of countries in Central America, across Sub-Saharan Africa, and in South Asia. And the collaboration is in concert with a large number of universities throughout the nation, actually. Yes, indeed. We have over 70 U.S. universities engaged in contributing to the global food security activities. In fact, here in Kansas, there are uh, 10 different programs based at the Kansas State University that they're involved with. Kansas State University leads four of those innovation labs, three of which were the subject of today's announcement. Actually, before we talk of the announcement proper, outline, if you would, those four laboratories and their missions, all of which are highly important, of course. Indeed. So these programs really span from upstream science all the way to farmer level and applied level activities. So starting with the upstream research, the Applied Wheat Genomics Innovation Lab is a program that really strives to take the latest breakthroughs in science in plant breeding and deliver those to improve the precision of developing heat tolerant wheat varieties and uh, improve the quality of wheat for bread making. So this research is contributing to work across South Asia, but also generates innovations that are contributing to wheat variety development here at home in the, in the U.S. The Sorghum and Millet Innovation Lab, also the subject of one of the extension announcements today, has been really focused on the entire spectrum of sorghum and millet research from crop improvement and variety development all the way through to product development for use of sorghum and millet, which will be the crops of the future. The Post-Harvest Loss Reduction Innovation Lab is one that's really looking at the other end of the spectrum um, in terms of the value chain. That program is really working to improve the safety and quality of foods and protect farmers and folks along the value chain from the losses associated with um, challenges like mycotoxins or aflatoxins or other quality challenges. And finally, the fourth lab here at K-State is the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab. And this lab is really looking at the broad spectrum of biophysical and market challenges that farmers face and really trying to help them figure out what's the best constellation of soil fertility, um, agronomic management practices, and acknowledgement of where the market opportunities are to help farmers figure out what the best opportunities for them to sustainably intensify their production systems and make them profitable. And as should be obvious to folks, but to say it out loud, this then enlists highly talented researchers and specialists at the university to contribute their knowledge and their expertise to each of these four. Absolutely. Kansas State University faculty are engaged in broad collaborations with actually many university partners across the United States, as well as developing countries scientists and researchers from other advanced research institutions across the world to really bring together and harness the capacity of science and technology to contribute to our goals of ending hunger and and poverty. Well, Vern, you hinted at it a couple of times here, but the announcement is that, well, three of the four laboratories were up for renewal, to put it that way, and USAID has agreed, in fact, to extend its support for those three. Yes, I really want to to reiterate, it is a very high bar to have a program extended. We generally award programs for a five-year period, which affords university researchers an opportunity to take a a concept, a proof of concept, and bring it to something that's um, potentially ready for for application. So the upstream research kinds of activities might generate outputs that other researchers might use, whereas some of the more downstream programs might develop innovations that are actually ready to be transferred to the private sector for scaling or for marketing. So this kind of research extension really affords the opportunity of the researchers to take it to the next 
next level. When we consider applicants for an extension of their award, it's a very high bar. We look at both the performance and the strategic direction of the technical area they're working in, as well as their actual vision for what that could be. And so we're really proud to announce that three of these labs here at K-State are in a good position to move forward with their work. Might mention which ones of the four. Uh, The Sorghum and Millet Innovation Lab will be continuing its work across East and West Africa and Haiti. The Applied Wheat Genomics Program, which works across South Asia, bringing um, wheat genomics uh, technologies and precision breeding approaches to uh, wheat breeding. And the post-harvest loss reduction program will be uh, continuing its work in a number of countries throughout the Feed the Future initiative. And just to note, the fourth of the four, the Sustainable Intensification Laboratory, isn't up for renewal yet. That's why it's not in the mix. That's right. So just to keep that in mind. Once more, this is something that doesn't just roll over automatically. These laboratories have to earn their keep, and it's obvious that USAID thinks that they have and then some. Yes, absolutely. So um, as part of our assessments of performance, we're really looking at not only what they set out to do, but did they reach higher and go farther than we thought they might? And in this case, all three programs really did a spectacular job of that. One of the most important components of these programs is their generation of benefits both to the developing country partner and to U.S. stakeholders. In fact, as part of Title 12 of the Foreign Assistance Act, which is the part of the legislation that authorizes these programs, there is a a stated intention for these programs to contribute both to American stakeholders and to our developing country partners. And each of these programs has done a really great job of reaching out to domestic constituents and stakeholders who have concerns or um, interests that are challenging their production here in the United States. So for instance, drought tolerance is a real concern for growers of sorghum from Texas to Kansas. Mm -hmm. And so this program is really looking at the Sorghum and Millet Innovation Lab is looking at the kinds of challenges like drought tolerance that would be a solution to these challenges that are going to improve the livelihoods of sorghum growers from Texas and Kansas all the way to Mali. So it's exciting news for K-State. It's exciting news for the U.S. Agency for International Development. And more broadly, the agency itself is accomplishing great things. Indeed, there continues to be strong bipartisan support across um, Congress for this initiative. From this initiative, we've seen that more than 5 million families are not hungry. And this is a really critical feature because it's an agricultural initiative because we know that agriculture is one of the most effective methods of reducing poverty. Agriculture is a very um, powerful tool for reducing poverty. But we also know agriculture generates food and food fills people's bellies. And so this is one of those really important links between nutrition and agriculture in this initiative. But thinking about the interests of folks here at home, We have um, focused over the last few years on a certain number of target countries where the work has been done, both at the ground level through our USAID missions, but as well as these research collaborations that are based here in the U.S. And when we think about the impacts of that in those target countries, all together, the whole initiative, the agricultural economies have been quite improved as a result of this initiative. But we also see that these countries where this activity was going on we have exported more than $1.4 billion of food and agricultural products to those countries that were participating. So that's $1.4 billion more than they were importing from us before. So I think that's a really important and potent message to deliver to your audience, that this is the kind of initiative that's doing well by doing good. It's a win-win, as they say these days. Vern, we thank you for coming and bringing your team with you to Kansas State to share the news of the extension of support for three of those four Feed the Future Innovation Laboratories housed here at the university, and we appreciate your time right here. Thank you so much, Eric. From the U.S. Agency for International Development's Bureau for Food Security, that's Vern Long, that agency renewing its support for the Feed the Future Laboratories here at K-State to the tune of $21.9 million dollars over the next five years. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu.
you're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Welcome back. Today's agricultural news headlines coming your way now, courtesy in part of DTN. U.S. and Mexican negotiators will continue their efforts this week to update the NAFTA agreement, an action that would set the stage for Canada to return to the negotiations. Mexico's chief trade negotiator, Aldefonso Guajardo, was upbeat yesterday after extensive talks with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. Guajardo said he and other Mexican negotiators would do whatever is necessary to reach an agreement with the U.S. that would then allow the the return of Canada to the talks. Guajardo predicted that the U.S. and Mexico would need at least a week of work to resolve issues with Canada whenever that nation is invited to rejoin the talks. Expectations were that the two sides potentially would reach an agreement last week, but that did not materialize. As the USDA finalizes its trade tariff relief program for farmers, the USDA secretary says the method used to quantify trade disruption impacts on producers is very much like one used in World Trade Organization dispute resolution processes. More on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. When Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue earlier this year announced a program to assist producers impacted by trade disruptions via short-term payments, he noted the payment rates within the market facilitation program would be based on a formula, considering tariff damage. But in terms of how USDA came up with the up to $12 billion in trade damage assistance included at MFP and two other programs included in the total aid package, the Secretary said the process was like what occurs with the World Trade Organization dispute. The methodology of how you get there is the way we would go to the WTO and issue a tariff complaint against these other countries for illegal retaliatory tariff. We'd have to prove what the tariff damage is and that's the methodology we use. An announcement of payment rates for impacted commodities is expected from USDA within the next few days with producer sign up then occurring sometime after Labor Day. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington D.C. While welcoming the EPA proposal to raise the biomass-based biodiesel requirement for 2020 to 2.4 billion gallons and the advanced biofuel level for 2019 to 4.8 billion gallons under their proposed levels for biofuels under the renewable fuel standard, a group of bipartisan senators said the levels still underestimate the existing potential of the biodiesel and renewable diesel industries in our states. Further, the lawmakers raised the issue of small refiner waivers granted under the RFS, which increased dramatically from 2016 and 2017 compared to historical levels. The lawmakers noted that the law requires the EPA to accurately account for small refiner economic hardship exemptions in the final rule. The RFS proposal from the EPA indicates there have been no hardship exemptions in 2019 and that the agency did not consider those exemptions in setting the proposed volume. The letter reads, it is critical that the EPA appropriately account for any small refiner economic hardship exemptions that it reasonably expects to grant during the 2019 compliance year in a final rule. Otherwise, the letter says, the EPA will not be able to fulfill its duty to ensure renewable volume obligations are met. To demonstrate the latest in crop irrigation technology, farmers in numerous counties have teamed up with Kansas State University and the Kansas Water Office to present water technology field days, and several of those are on the slate for this week around Kansas. These are a way for producers to see how the newest research and technology is being applied in real-life settings on private farms. Now, there are two of these going on today. One is actually already underway in Harvey County. The other is set to go very shortly in Sedgwick County at the Jacob Farm. That's to start at 11 o'clock this morning. Tomorrow, there are two of these field days taking place, one in Finney County at T&O Farms, 10 o'clock in the morning, then tomorrow in Seward County at the Hatcher Land and Cattle Company. That'll start at 2 in the afternoon. 
Also one of these field days in Sherman County at the Northwest Kansas Tech College Farms, 9 o'clock in the morning. Then Thursday field days in Scott County at Circle C Farms and in Wichita County Thursday afternoon, Long Water Tech Farm. The last of these water technology field days in Ford County on Friday at the Harshberger Farm. Contact your local extension office for further information on these K-State water technology field days. Now, this week's edition of Tree Tales. Here's K-State Forester, Bob Atchison. Bob? Each year, the Kansas Forest Service and the Kansas Forestry Association join forces to recognize farmers and ranchers who have done an exceptional job integrating agroforestry into their operations. Agroforestry uses trees and shrubs to maximize both conservation and economic benefits associated with agricultural production. The most common agroforestry practices in Kansas are windbreaks, shelter belts, streamside riparian forest buffers, and some civil pasture in the southeast part of the state where cattle graze under pecan orchards. This year, the 2018 Kansas Agroforestry Award was presented to the Kickapoo Tribe for the significant conservation work that they've done and accomplished on their reservation located west of Horton. Through tree planting and cedar tree revetments, the tribe has stabilized miles of stream bank along the Delaware River, improving water quality and saving valuable cropland. The tribe has also developed alternative watering facilities for livestock to improve water quality. Jim Wrights, formerly with the Kickapoo Environmental Office, was responsible for the success of these practices. Kansas farmers and ranchers will have an opportunity to see these successful practices firsthand at the Fall Forestry Field Day scheduled for October 16th at the Kickapoo Reservation. In addition to stream restoration projects, the Field Day will feature a mature native black walnut stand where sessions on woodland and wildlife management will be taught by ecologists and foresters. Ornithologists and plant ID specialists will lead tours throughout the day to help participants develop a better understanding of the birds and plants in their woodlands. Information on forest inventory of the tribe's woodlands will also be shared, as well as how landowners can gather similar information in their own woodlands to make good management decisions. A hot lunch and refreshments will be provided Registration is as simple as calling the Kansas Forest Service at 785-532-3300 or check us out on the web at www.kansasforest.org. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service. You've been listening to another Tree Tale. Thanks, Bob. And this is Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Older Kansas 4-H youth looking to develop leadership skills are encouraged to apply to be a Kansas 4-H Youth Leadership Council representative and National 4-H Conference delegate. Kansas 4-H Events Coordinator Sarah Keatley and Southeast Area 4-H Specialist Beth Hinshaw says that being a representative or delegate provides youth a great opportunity to acquire many life-building skills. Beth, first off, maybe just some background on the Youth Council. We elect and select members of our Kansas 4-H Youth Leadership Council every year at the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum. When this was all put together years ago, one of the things that they thought about was that it might be good to have some terms that were two-year terms and some terms that were one-year terms so that you had a little bit more stability and consistency. And so we elect members from each area to the 4-H Council, but then the young people who are selected for a national conference, they also come on to 4-H Council. 
and those elected members will have a one-year term, and those that are selected for national conference will have a two-year term. And I'll let Sarah talk a little bit about the national conference and what all that entails. Right. So National 4-H Conference is actually the Secretary of Agriculture for the United States, his youth leadership conference that he hosts in Washington, D.C. Kansas sends up to six delegates, and they get to participate in workshops about different policies that are happening around interests that they have. Those could be ag-related, those could be health-related, those could be um, youth development-related. So those youth get an opportunity to learn how policies are created, and then they get to present those policies that they put together to those respective departments. So they get to go to the Department of Ag in Washington, D.C. and present their policy to a committee, or they get to present to the Senate Ag Committee. It's an honor to really go on this trip, and it's quite the reward. It's one of our capstone trips that I would say that a lot of our youth get to take. And there is an application process for being on both of these councils. There is. So the application process this year is the same for Youth Council and National 4-H Conference, and it is an online application that can be found on the Kansas 4-H website at kansas4-h.org. It is the same application, so you can apply to be on Youth Council and you can apply to be a National 4-H Conference delegate when you go through that process. What are some things that they should maybe have in hand before they start doing this application process? Because I assume it's a fairly lengthy process. It is, Jeff. And actually, when they go and find the application, We actually have a copy of the application right on the web where they can open that up and look through all of the questions and know what they're going to be answering when they open the online application. And we feel like that's just one of those really good life skills, you know, to be prepared ahead of time. And so we're trying to help them do that. So in addition to the answers to the application that they are going to provide, they are also going to provide information to two references where they can go and fill out a reference form and also upload a reference letter. So this might be a teacher, might be somebody from their 4-H club. Correct. We like one of those to be an agent or a 4-H club leader who is really familiar with their 4-H work. And then the second one can be anybody. And is there a minimum age for being on one of these councils? To be on the State Youth Leadership Council, you need to be 14 to 18 by January 1 of 2019. And you heard Sarah describe what happens when you go to a National 4-H conference. And so we want kids to be a little bit older for that. So that is for any 4-H member ages 15 to 18 before January 1 of 2019. And really, it sounds like this is for people who are really interested in leadership aspects. It is, especially for the National 4-H Conference delegates. Those youth really learn a lot about leadership, a lot about responsibility when they get to go to Washington, D.C., and they get to meet with other delegates across the United States. A lot of our delegates have come back with new ideas from other youth from other states, and so they have the opportunity to share what we do here in Kansas, and then they learn what other folks do in other states. And we have some examples, and one that I always like to point to is our conference event, which is for kids who are 12 to 14 who are just kind of aging out of 4-H camp but maybe not quite ready to go on to events and activities. That idea was born at National Conference. And they came home and started promoting it. And then it took several years before it took hold. But we wouldn't have conference if we wouldn't have had kids go to National Conference and listen to their peers, and then think about new and different ways we can do things in Kansas. And I would also add on that our Youth Leadership Council, even those youth who apply to be on that, they put on our statewide events across the state. They put on Citizenship in Action and the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum. And so those youth learn a tremendous amount of responsibility and the planning process and the different things that go into planning those events for their peers. And this really is a commitment. It's, it's a time commitment as well as the one to two year commitment. Most definitely. They're going to meet four to six times per year. All of the different committees have conference calls. We have expectations that they're at the different events that they put on. And then certainly, you know, when they go to Washington, D.C., that's a, a week out of their spring as well where they're going to be gone. And there's some prep work involved for that as well. So what is the application process? I know that it is online. Do we have some deadlines that need to be met? 
Well, we always have deadlines. <laughs> and as Sarah mentioned, that application process is the same process. So when you apply, you're just going to check if you're applying for national conference or for state council or both. So there's an actual application that they're going to do online, and then they'll also do those two references as well. All of that has got to be completed by October 1st. And so by 11.59 on October 1st, that has to be completed. And I should say 11.59 Central Daylight Time. And I imagine you would tell the 4-H'ers to not be scared by the process to put your name out there. Most definitely. We think this is a great opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, this is all about career and life skills. I mean, we're, we're all going to be applying for things throughout our life. We're all going to have different interviews throughout our life. So You know, the sooner you start having those experiences, the better you get. And I would echo what Beth is saying. Youth have nothing to lose by applying, and they have everything to gain. And so taking the moment to fill that application out and get that information down, go through the interview process, go through that experience, because you will gain more than you will ever realize just by applying. That's Kansas 4-H Events Coordinator Sarah Keatley and Southeast Area 4-H Specialist Beth Hinshaw. Again, for more information about applying for Kansas 4-H Youth Leadership Council and National 4-H Conference, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.